to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, we are told, There arose a new king, or new Pharaoh, over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And as a result, God's people are now going to suffer over that. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Exodus in our Old Testament book series. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church. We want to encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area. You'll find friendly people there who love God, who love the Bible, and who are concerned about souls. If you'd like to have a Bible study or you've got questions about the Word of God, those people there would be glad to help you with that in your study of the Word of God. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Bible. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, we encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You can order our media there, or you can call us or write to us at the information given at the end of the program. Also, don't forget to download our app, from both the Google Play Store and the Apple Store. It's a great way to study the Word of God on the go. We've got all of our lessons and a host of other good media on that app as well. And friend, we want to encourage you today to locate your Bible, to have it handy, as we're going to look to the Word of God together as we study the wonderful book of Exodus. The book of Exodus in the Old Testament, the second book in the Old Testament, accounts further accounts God's dealing with Israel working toward ultimately bringing Christ into the world. The word Exodus literally means ekhados, the way out or the road out. God's people, based on the teaching of Exodus 1 verse 8, are now because a new Pharaoh arises who doesn't know or recognize Joseph and doesn't remember or care about how God's people saved uh, the Egyptians, a new Pharaoh is now going to arise. He's going to bring God's people into bondage and as a result, God's going to raise up a deliverer and God is going to further separate His people as His own chosen people that He will ultimately work through. Key words in the book of Exodus are deliverer or deliverance and the idea of redemption. God delivering, redeeming His people from bondage out of that servitude and separating them to be his own nation and his own people. In fact, this is expressed very clearly by God in one of the key verses in Exodus chapter 6, verse number 7. Look at what Exodus chapter 6, verse 7 says. The Bible records God saying to his people, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And so God says, you're going to be my special chosen people. I'm going to deliver you and we're going to have a special relationship. And of course, God would ultimately work through them to bring the Savior into the world. We have several key chapters that stand out in our minds in the book of Exodus. Of course, chapter 12, where we have the, the Passover and the Passover lamb, where the blood of that lamb is put on the doorpost. And when that final plague on the Egyptian come, on the Egyptians come, uh, and, and because of that plague, the firstborn dies, when God, God saw the blood on the doorpost, He passed over that house. The blood of the lamb is what covered, sealed, and took care of that family from death. And spiritually speaking, isn't it the blood of the Lamb 
that when His Spirit is applied to ours, when His blood is applied to our spirits, it protects us from spiritual death and destruction. What a wonderful picture there. And then, of course, one of the most memorable chapters, Exodus chapter 20. We have God giving the Ten Commandment law to the nation of Israel and further illustrating, integrating them into that uh, relationship with Him. Now, there is a key phrase that you will find throughout the book of Exodus, and that phrase mainly is spoken to Israel, to the Egyptians, and ultimately to Pharaoh. God will say some nine times, Let my people go. And so here we have God taking care of His people, making sure they're provided for, and ultimately going to be released from the bondage and the servitude that we see under Pharaoh. Now the book of Exodus can be outlined very easily in chapters 1 through 12. We have Israel under bondage in Egypt. Then from chapters 12 through 18, you've got Israel leaving Egypt and journeying to Mount Sinai. Then in chapters 19 through 40, we have Israel at Mount Sinai receiving the law of God and further instructions that are going to be given for them there. And so they are freed from slavery. They head toward that monumental Mount Sinai and God gives them many detailed instructions to further their relationship with Him in chapters 19 through 40. Now, as we think about the book of Exodus, and for our purposes today, we really want to think about the practical uh, living messages that Christians can learn. I'm not living during the time of the Exodus. I'm not living during that time of coming out of Egyptian bondage. How does the book of Exodus and the messages therein apply to a Christian in the 21st century today? Friend, Romans 15:4 teaches us this. The Bible says in the New Testament, the things that were written before time, before the writing of the New Testament, under the old law, the things that were written before time are written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might find hope. There are practical lessons about God, about man, about God's dealings with man that haven't changed. And it's those lessons that we can glean and learn from in our Old Testament studies. And so what are some of those lessons? Well, friend, one of the first is seen in Exodus chapter 3. When Moses is on the backside of Midian uh, taking care of Jethro's sheep, his father-in-law's sheep, God is now going to appear to Moses. And God teaches Moses and us a very powerful lesson there. Look in Exodus chapter 3. And I want you to notice what the Bible says, God says in verse number 5. Then God said to Moses here, Then God said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. You remember Moses is tending his father-in-law's uh, flocks. He looks up on that mountain and he sees that great burning bush and his curiosity is piqued and so he goes to further uh, see about it. When he gets there, the bush is burning but it's not consumed and, and God speaks to him out of that burning bush, take the sandals off your feet, the place where you stand is holy ground. Friend, Moses had entered into the presence of God at that moment. And God is going to impress some things upon Moses' mind about being a great leader and deliverer. But one of the most powerful messages is the reverence that was demanded in the presence of God. Friend, when we worship God, when we come before God with our, with our hearts, and when we gather as Christians to honor and magnify Him, that attitude of reverence still needs to exist in every person's heart. Uh, the sandals that Moses wore were looked at by God as dirty, uh, unclean, and God wanted him to present himself in a clean way to him, in a reverent way worthy of worshiping God. And friend, when we present ourselves before God, we want to do so with a reverent attitude, 
I want to realize that I'm coming before the Almighty. Psalm 95, we are to kneel down before the Lord our Maker. We're to give Him honor in everything that we do. Our heart, our mind, our attitude needs to be that of reverence. I need to realize I'm in the presence of Almighty God. What an awesome uh, fear and respect invoking environment that ought to be. But just like with Moses, my appearance also ought to represent an attitude and a demeanor of reverence. I want to give God my best and I want to come before Him in a way that shows respect and honor for Almighty God. I don't want to come before God in a, in a, a tattered, disheveled, uh, irrespectful or disrespectful type of demeanor or attitude or presence. No, I want to give God what He deserves and God deserves my best in every way. And so reverence and worshiping and coming before God is clearly seen in Exodus chapter 3. Then we learn another great teaching about God and that is that God Himself is the great I Am. Moses is now, as he speaks with God in this burning bush event, God talks out of the bush to him. Moses is going to get instructions. You're going to go back to Egypt. You're going to tell my people to uh, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses is thinking, okay, that's all good and well, but who am I going to say said that? Listen to Exodus chapter 3, what God says to Moses in verse number 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The I Am has sent me to you. You know, when I think about this idea of the I Am, and when you study that further in both the Hebrew and in John 8, where Jesus says, I Am, you know, the God of Abraham, the God of I, I, I Am, that great I Am, when you think about those two references, both the God and the Christ and the totality of the Godhead, that idea of I am carries with it past, present, and future. Not just the one who is right now, but who was, who is, and who will always be. Uh, it reminds me a lot of Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The idea it carries the idea that this one uh, fills every aspect of time, past, present, future, and is even greater than that itself. And so the great I am is who sent you, the one who was, who is, and who always will be. Uh, Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2, from everlasting to everlasting, I am God. That's the one. The everlasting, eternal, almighty, all-powerful God is the one who sent me. God says, I want you to tell that to Israel and ultimately to Pharaoh. And friend, when I think about the nature of God, the God that we serve, His character is one of the most wonderful things about God. Loving, kind, merciful, eternal, always has been, always will be, the God who fulfills every promise, who cannot lie, who will not uh, be involved in sin. That's the nature. The nature of our God is impressed upon us, and as a result, it makes us want to follow and give our lives to Almighty God. Then another very powerful living message that we find in the book of Exodus is about the Passover lamb and the Passover blood that would be applied. In Exodus chapters 10 through 12, we're winding down the final plagues in the book of Exodus and Pharaoh has been convinced, but not enough to actually let God's people go. And so God is going to send this final plague the death of the firstborn of every family does not put the blood of the lamb on the lintel and the doorpost. And so if the blood's not there, firstborn in that house is going to die. Death angel, as it were, is going to come and that, and that firstborn's going to die. But if the blood of a lamb is placed on the doorpost and on the headpiece, the lintel of that house, he would pass over. And of course, Pharaoh is not willing to accept God. He doesn't put the blood on his doorpost or on his lintel. 
his firstborn son dies. And it's that final plague where he says, get out, basically. I don't want anything more to do with the people of Israel. But there's a powerful lesson there. And I want you to see it in uh, chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12. I want you to notice with me verse number 22 and 23. God says to Moses, here's what you need to do. You shall take a bunch of hyssop, uh, like a sponge, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, strike the lintel, the top piece, and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. Now listen to this. And when he sees the blood on the lintel, on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses and to strike you. And so God provides a way of salvation for anybody who will follow His commands. Death did not have to come to them if they did what He said. Of course, Pharaoh wasn't willing to do that, and there were harsh consequences to that. We think, okay, well, what does that have to do with the New Testament today? Friend, when we think about the Passover, which is kind of what's happening here, God passed over their house, and when we think about the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb that was applied to their doorpost, and then when we hear these words in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Christ is our Passover. Christ is our Pascal, that Passover Lamb that is given in the New Testament. It's such a great type here. Uh, something had to die. That, the blood of that lamb was placed on the doorpost, on the, uh, the entrance into, as it were. And Christ is our Passover. He's that lamb of God, John 1, 29. It's His precious blood that covers the sins of the world, 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20, and to escape spiritual death and for God to pass over in judgment and in destruction, ultimately and finally, on men and women today. Friend, it's only going to be by the blood of the Lamb. We contact, contact the Lord's death when we obey the gospel, culminating in baptism. We're buried with Him in baptism in which we access or contact His death. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. And thus the person who is going to escape spiritual death is the person who's a Christian, is the person who Jesus' blood has been applied to, spiritually speaking. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Hebrews 9, verse 22. It's appointed a man once to die, and then the judgment. We're all going to die. We're all going to stand before God in judgment. What separates men and women at the judgment? Has the blood of Christ been applied to them? Are they a Christian? Have they obeyed the gospel? Have their sins been washed away in the blood of the Lamb? You remember what Saul of Tarsus was told in Acts 22, 16, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. It's the blood of Christ that washes away sin. What's going to keep us from being? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And then we can know that we're right in the sight of God. And so you've got this really very typical type of Christ in the Passover lamb mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, and seen in multiple places throughout the Old and New Testament. All right, another very practical lesson that we see from the book of Exodus is that God will fight for you. Uh, Exodus chapter 14. I want you to look at what God says in verse number 14. Such a powerful message. Very simply stated, God says, the Bible says, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Now, what's going on here? Well, in Exodus 12, in that final plague, when Pharaoh's firstborn died, Pharaoh finally says, no more. I give up. And so he lets God's people go. But then he has a second thought about that. And as they are traveling along the way, here come the Egyptians pursuing them. And, and now Moses and all the Israelites are wondering, here come the Egyptians. What are we going to do? Well, here's the answer. Hold your peace. Don't get upset. Don't worry and don't freak out. Well, what do you mean by that? The Lord will fight for you. The same God who rained down all those plagues, the same God who destroyed, who killed the firstborn and made Pharaoh realize, I'm the real God, let my people go. 
He's the God that's going to fight for you. And of course, we all recall the events of the Red Sea. When God said, I'm going to fight for you, God opened up the waters of the Red Sea. God's people went through on dry ground. They all, every one of them got to the other side. Pharaoh's people start in. The walls of the water close down upon them, and God did fight for them. We think, okay, well, how does that apply to me? Friend, in the battles that we face, in the challenges that arise, in the temptations and snares that Satan might throw out before us, do we not realize God will still fight for us? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But listen now, God is faithful. There's the answer. God is faithful, who with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God's going to help us in every way. And when God fights for us, friend, there's not an enemy, a foe, or a temptation that can't be conquered. And so what a powerful lesson from the book of Exodus about God Himself, that He will indeed fight for us. And with God on our side, friend, there's nothing that we cannot accomplish. All right, another lesson that we clearly see uh, from the book of Exodus, and this is one that how we can say over and over again how we wish Israel would have listened to what God said here. In the giving of the Ten Commandments, God clearly condemned idolatry and the worshiping of false gods. Look in Exodus chapter 20 where God gives the Ten Commandments and notice this lesson God says to the people. Exodus 20 verses 3 and 4. You shall have no other gods before me. And what do you mean, God? You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water or under the earth. You shall not bow to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And it goes on to tell more about that. But friend, here's what we want. Uh, here's what Israel needed to hear. Don't worship other gods. Don't go out and carve images of things I've created or other things and try to worship them. I'm your God. I'm a, I'm a jealous God. I want you to be my children, as it were. Don't worship other gods. And so God condemned idolatry. And as you will follow the history of Israel, over and over and over again, Israel would get in trouble. Israel would go into captivity. Israel would be defeated by their enemies. They would suffer great loss. Many times, of course, they're worshiping, as the Bible will say, they're up on the hilltop worshiping the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the false gods. And so they had a problem with that throughout their history. They didn't listen to God, and there were consequences because of it. We think, okay, well, how does that apply to me? I'm not carving an image or worshiping an idol. Covetousness, the Bible says in Colossians 3, is idolatry. Basically, anything we put before God in the place of God, or we give more importance than God, doesn't that become what we're worshiping? Whether it be family, whether it be the almighty dollar, whether it be recreation, whether it be our own interests and passions, it doesn't have to be a little carved Buddha or an image to be a God necessarily. Whatever we give precedence to over God becomes our God. And so we need to realize that if we're not careful, other things, can take the place of God, which God deserves first place. Matthew 6, 33, Philippians 1, 21. Anything that we put in that first place instead of God, doesn't that in some ways become what we're worshiping and what we're honoring more than God? And then another practical lesson from the book of Exodus, and this is such a powerful one that Israel needed to learn and that we need to learn today is don't just do something because it's popular. Don't follow the crowd just because that's what the crowd wants you to do. Look in Exodus chapter 23. For young people especially, when peer pressure is such a, um, a, a big part of their life, let's realize don't just do what everybody else is doing. Look in Exodus chapter 23 and look what God said here. God said, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute as to turn aside after many pervert justice. Don't, don't do what everybody else is doing. When people do stuff, you need to be your own person. You need to make your own decisions based off the Bible. And when people are doing evil or something that's not right, 
don't just go along with the flow. Don't let, if you know something's wrong, don't do it because everybody else is doing it. There's a lot of pressure. Drugs, alcohol, premarital sex, immorality, immodesty, everybody else is doing that. And we know it may not be right, but so that we'll feel accepted or cool, we kind of go along with that. Friend, that's not the way Christians need to do, and that's not how uh, we need to live our lives. We need to be people who are separate. We need to be people who are unique, and we need to follow very carefully after God's teaching and to show what God wants us to do. Now, another practical lesson that we kind of want to bring things to a close with is found in Exodus 32, and this is one of the great tragedies in the book of Exodus, the tragedy of sin. Look at Exodus 32. I want you to notice verses 31 following. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh, these people have committed a great sin, have made for themselves a, a god of gold. Yet now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. And the Lord said, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. And of course you remember that scene very likely as the scene of the golden calf. And Moses pleads before God, Please forgive these people. And of course if they're willing to return, repent, God's willing to do that. But if not... He's going to blot them out of his book of remembrance. Friend, we read of another book in the New Testament, and that's the book of life. And whoever's not found in the book of life, that person doesn't have hope. His name is written in when he becomes a child of God, Revelation 3. And to get into heaven, you've got to be written in that book of life, Revelation 20, verses 12 through 15. And so the, the serious nature of sin is seen here as well. Sin always separates a man from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, but the book of Exodus teaches us this. God provides a way out. He provided for His people and He provides today. Jesus is that way out. He is the great deliverer, even greater than Moses today according to Hebrews 3. And if a person will submit to God's will and follow Him, he can be their Savior. Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you a Christian? Jesus said this, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He's the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. And as we study these principles, friend, we encourage you, look to Jesus, the way out of sin and the way into heaven. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.